So, uh, Pastor Shauna and I will occasionally talk about what we call pastor perks. Like, one of the best perks as a pastor is being able to do life with a whole room full of amazing people like you. Another pastor perk is getting to represent you all in some of the coolest places around town. So last Thursday, I got to represent you all in an interview with some journalism students for GVTV. And after that, I had a meeting scheduled for Lunar Bowl about a possible Good People fundraiser. You know who bowls, by the way, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on a Thursday? Serious bowlers. (laughs) That's who, and they were seriously good. Now, my Eagle Media interview, it was taking place at 1 o'clock, so I popped home to grab some lunch right before to let our dog, Oslo, get some backyard time before I put him into lockup for a few hours. And so we hung out on the deck. It was really nice. It was way warmer than it is today. And I ate, and I thought, I'll leave him out for a second, pop in, freshen up, and then put him in his crate. And in those three minutes that I was inside, Oslo discovered mud for the first time in his life, and apparently Oslo loves mud. And I had to leave, like right away, only Oslo was in no shape to come inside, and we, don't, we can't leave him out yet while we're gone, because he might get into trouble if we're not there. Apparently it doesn't matter if we're there. He was not presentable enough to be in the house. So I grabbed his leash and I ran in the backyard to try and stop the insanity, only I seriously underestimated how much mud was already involved. And so the next thing I know, my interview pants, my interview shoes, my everything is also covered in mud. And so suddenly, no longer, I was no longer presentable either. So I hooked up the hose and sprayed down the dog. And when you have a puppy, everything's fun because this is the first time you've ever done that before. And so that just got Oslo more excited, me more muddy, and him less containable, which meant in order to get him inside and in the tub, I had to pick up 50 pounds of wet, sopping, muddy disaster and carry him into the bathroom, toss him into the tub and try and shampoo him. But he was so excited, he's splashing and bouncing and mud is flying all over the bathroom and all over me. And at this point, the dog and I and the house were no longer presentable. (laughs) And I was going to be late. I mean, I, I was already late. And so I dried Oslo, I muscled him into his crate, I washed my face, I cleaned my glasses, changed my clothes, I rushed over to good people like chaos hadn't just unleashed on my... Actually, chaos was leashed for part of that time, and it didn't matter at all. I had to make sure that I was presentable. That's how Tim Keller, he's the founding pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City. That's how he defines this theological term, righteousness, being presentable. If you went through the prodigal God study that we did a couple years ago, you might remember Tim Keller. My go-to definition for righteousness is a right relationship. When we are made righteous, our relationship with the Lord is made right. But I kind of like now how Tim Keller puts it. He said, when we are made righteous, we are once again presentable before God. We are presentable in the eyes of God. It's righteousness. And it's one of the last stops as we journey this labyrinth of faith toward salvation. But how can we, we be made righteous before the Lord? How can we be made presentable? How can any of us hope to write a relationship with God that has been broken since Adam and Eve were banished from the garden? I mean, I can't even seem to keep my relationships with my family and friend right half the time, much less my relationship with God. Well, this, today's scripture is how the prophet Jeremiah answered that question way back in the 6th century BC. And so despite the fact that there were 613 laws in the Old Testament to help the Israelites get themselves right with God, despite, despite the fact they had a whole temple system 
of priests and sacrifice built upon getting them right before God. Despite the fact that God gave them the kings they asked for, the Israelites in Jeremiah's day failed miserably in trying to earn righteousness on their own. And so God allowed the Babylonians to destroy the temple, destroy the holy city of Jerusalem, and carry many of the Israelites into captivity in Babylon. But through Jeremiah, this prophet, God poured out his grace, and he promised an end to their captivity and a once-for-all king to be their righteousness, our righteousness. And so here's what Jeremiah the prophet said. This is verses, or chapter 23, verses 1 through 6. He said, how terrible it will be for the shepherds who lead my people astray, announced the Lord. They are destroying and scattering the sheep that belong to my flock. So the Lord, the God of Israel, speaks to the shepherds who take care of my people. He tells them, you have scattered my sheep. You have driven them away. You have not taken good care of them. So I will punish you for the evil things you have done, announces the Lord. I myself will then gather those who are left alive in my flock. I will gather them out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their own land. There, my sheep will have many lambs. There will be many more of them. I will place shepherds over them who will take good care of them, and my sheep will not be terrified or afraid anymore, and none of them will be missing, not one announces the Lord. A new day is coming, announces the Lord. At that time, I will raise up for David's royal line a godly branch. He will be a king who will rule wisely. He will do what is fair and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved. Israel will live in safety. And the branch will be called the Lord who makes us right right with himself. The Lord, our righteousness. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you that you have gathered us back together. We thank you that you've gathered us here together today, that we might praise you and that we might know something more of you than when we first walked in these doors. And so speak to us. Pour out your righteousness upon us. Make us right with you. Make us right with one another. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. So could you hear in Jeremiah's words that the people who were supposed to be helping God's people make their relationship with the Lord right again, they were doing the opposite. The shepherds, and and by the way, whenever you hear the word shepherd, especially in the Old Testament, especially when prophets are speaking, you can think leader, you can think priest or king, leader. And so the leaders aren't leading the people back into God's presence. Instead, they're leading them astray. The leaders are the ones destroying and scattering the flock. The priests, the kings, the teachers of the law are leading people away from God. When John Wesley preached about righteousness way back in 1765 in his sermon, The Lord, Our Righteousness, he chose these words from Jeremiah because he saw that the church leaders and the political leaders were still turning people away from God 2,000 years later. Thank goodness that's not happening anymore. The ones who were supposed to bring people to righteousness, instead they were tearing each other and everyone else apart. Instead of writing relationships, they were breaking them. This is what he wrote to the church, and I think he could have written this yesterday. Hear these words. How dreadful and how innumerable are the contests which have arisen about religion, the fights over religion, and not only among the children of this world, among those who knew not what true religion was. But even among the children of God, those who have experienced the kingdom of God within them, who have tasted of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. How many of these, that's all you, right? Righteous people. How many of these in all ages, instead of joining together against a common enemy, have turned their weapons against each other 
And so not only wasted their precious time, but hurt one another's spirits, weakened each other's hands, and so hindered the great work of their common master. How many of the weak have hereby been offended? How many of the lame turned out of the way? How many sinners confirmed in their disregard of all religion and their contempt of those that profess it? And how many of the excellent ones upon earth have been constrained to weep in secret places? You see, the not leaders of not just the Church of England, but of all denominations were arguing over theological points that would be lost on most Christians, but they were causing public wars of words. Often, Wesley said, these leaders, those shepherds, actually, they were just saying the exact same thing, just using different words for it and arguing about that. Anyone ever been arguing with someone only to realize that end of the day, you're saying the exact same thing? Like, you're yelling the same thing at each other, just maybe using subtly different words? And there's more than a few Christians doing that right now. There's more than a few Methodists, to be honest. We're gearing up for our global general conference, and I'm a bit worried there'll be a few more yelling the same thing at each other across the aisle in the coming weeks. And how many people do you think those public disagreements and yelling and arguments are bringing to Christ? (laughs) Right? We wear our green or we wear our orange and we fight over our Jesus and our faith. No, all the shepherds are doing is scattering the flock, confirming sinners in their disregard of all religion, to use Wesley's words. We're not making relationships right. What are we doing? Breaking them. And then all too often we... Christians aren't presentable, not before our neighbors and certainly not before God. And then again, on our own, we haven't been presentable before God since Adam and Eve ate the fruit. Tim Keller reminds us of this. You remember, after they ate the fruit, after Adam and Eve believed the the serpent's lies, after they sinned, what's the first thing they did? They hid. Right? They hid from the Lord when they heard him among the trees in the garden. They hid themselves from God. They had spent every moment of the eternity up to that point in God's gracious presence, walking the garden with him, naming creation with him. But now they didn't think they were what? Presentable anymore. And so they hid. They were no longer righteous, and their relationship with God was broken. That moment always reminds me of, I I don't know, I think I was like eight or 10 years old. My brother had an IBM PC Junior, one of the early personal computers. And they had this really primitive game called Minecraft. And I love, or not Minecraft, that's not primitive, that's new. Mine Shaft, it was a very different game. And, And I played it while tipping my chair back and putting my knees up against the computer table. And my brother didn't like that. And he would always say, hey, stop. He would yell at me, stop doing it. You're going to knock the desk over and the computer is going to fall. I knew that would never happen. Until it did. And the minute the desk started to tip and the computer started to slide off toward the ground, I didn't think to grab it or steady it. I just started running like away from the computer, away from my brother, away from anyone who might see me after I had done something so stupid, I just said the S word, after I had hurt my brother and his computer, I didn't want to be seen by anyone. I was unpresentable. And so I ran, I I kid you not, I ran out the back door into the garage, into my, and I buried my, because this is back in the 80s, I buried myself in the back floorboard of our station wagon, head down. I'd broken our relationship. Things weren't right between my brother and I or me and the computer. Has anyone else been there? Your relationship breaks. You've done something. They've done something. And you can't bear the thought of seeing that person. Or more to the point, actually, you can't bear the thought of that person seeing you. That person seeing you. 
You can't bear the thought of them seeing you standing there covered in mud. At that moment, with Oslo in the mud, is there anything that Oslo could have done to make himself presentable? I mean, he's a pretty cute little guy when he's not covered. He's not little anymore, but when he's not covered in mud. But can he clean himself that quickly? Can he start a bath for himself? Can he turn the hose on? No, you need opposable thumbs. He doesn't have those. Oslo needed me to make him presentable. This is what he looked like after the bath, that when I got home to walk him. He still didn't want to look at me. You see that? I can't see you. You can't see me. Oslo needed me to wash him clean. It was the only way he was going to get back in his father's house. It was the only way for our relationship to be made right again. Anyone hear where this is going? Right? Like Oslo, we can do nothing to make ourselves righteous before God. Not a thing. Just like we can't justify ourselves before God. We covered this last week. No, only Christ and Christ alone was able to wash us clean through his death and resurrection. Christ took our brokenness and he replaced it with his righteousness. He sees Christ and and Christ alone who can make us presentable before God. Who can make our relationship with God right again. Who can make it possible one day for us to return to our Father's house. I mean, we try to make ourselves presentable, right? We put on the outward appearance of good, sensible Christians. We pretend to have it all together, like me going on my first date at at 15 years old, putting cover-up on my zits, thinking it's going to hide them. Instead, it's just like zit highlighter. Like, hey, look here. I'm using mousse, gel, and hairspray to make my hair do something, this mass of cowlicks and whirls that I have into something marginally intentional. I'm smearing my dad's Old Spice on my pits and then slathering my neck with my brother's polo cologne because it's the 90s, right? And polo and Old Spice were not meant to go <laughs> together. And I'm leaving my glasses at home, even though it means I'm not actually going to see the movie we're going to. I just don't want to be seen in them. I'm trying to mask who I really am, even though the truth will always (laughs) make itself known. It, It always does. God knows our hearts. And that's why he sent his son, to justify us when there's no justifying some of the things that we've done. You remember the definition of of justification, right? Who remembers? It's forgiveness. Forgiveness. Through Christ, first, we are forgiven. And once we're forgiven and our sins are washed away, then his righteousness becomes our righteousness. We're presentable before God once again. We're in a relationship with God once again. Just like God clothed Adam and Eve so they might be made presentable, so Christ clothes us in righteousness. And Jeremiah, way back in the the B.C.s, told us that Christ would. He said, a new day is coming, announces the Lord. And at that time, I will raise up for David's royal line a godly branch, a king who will rule wisely. He will do what is fair and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved. Israel will live in safety. And the branch will be called the Lord who makes us what? Right with himself. The Lord, our righteousness. I can't think of a better illustration of this journey from forgiveness to right relationship than a story I've shared before here. On February 12, 1993, a young man, O'Shea Israel, he was 16, and he got in an argument 
with a 20-year-old named Loramian Bird. They were at a party up in Minnesota. They were both young punks being punks, only O'Shea had a gun. And before things were over, Loramian would be dead. O'Shea would be in prison. And Loramian's mom, Mary Johnson, would lose her only son. And she'd become broken, wrecked with anger, and wrecked with bitterness. And before long, both O'Shea, he was locked up so that no one could see him in his unpresentable state. And Mary, too, though, in her anger and bitterness, was unpresentable to the world. Her family told her as much. Until this happened. And this is their story. You and I met at Stillwater Prison. I wanted to know if you were in the same mindset of what I remember from court, where I wanted to go over and hurt you, but you were not that 16-year-old. You were a grown man. I shared with you about my son. And he became human to me. You know, when I met you, it was like, okay, this guy is real. And then when it was time to go, you broke down and started shedding tears. And the initial thing to do was just try to hold you up as best I can. Just hug you like I would my own mother, you know. After you left the room, I began to say, I just hugged the man that murdered my son. And I instantly knew that all that anger and the animosity, all the stuff I had in my heart for 12 years for you, I knew it was over that I had totally forgiven you. As far as receiving forgiveness from you, sometimes I still don't know how to take it because I haven't totally forgiven myself yet. It's something that I'm learning from you. I won't say that I have learned yet because it's still a process that I'm going through. I treat you as I would treat my son and our relationship is beyond belief. We live next door to one another. Yeah, so you can see what I'm doing. You know, firsthand. Mm -hmm. We actually bump into each other all the time, leaving in and out of the house. And our conversations, they come from, boy, how come you ain't called over here to check on me in a couple (laughs) of days? You ain't even asked me if I need my garbage to go out. Uh I find those things funny (laughs) because it's a relationship with a mother for real. Well, my natural son is no longer here. I didn't see him graduate. You know, you're going to college. I'll have the opportunity to see you graduate. I didn't see him get married. Hopefully one day I'll be able to experience that with you. Just to hear you say those things and to be in my life in the manner in which you are is my motivation. It motivates me to make sure that I stay on the right path. You still believe in me. And the fact that you can do it despite how much pain I cause you, it's amazing. I know it's not an easy thing, you know, to be able to share our story together. So I admire that you can do this. I love you, lady. I love you too, son. Could you hear it all throughout? They were unpresentable, both of them at that point. And one day, Mary goes to find out if he was still that unpresentable young man in the courtroom. She breaks down, he hugs her, and then eventually she says, I forgave you. First comes the forgiveness. And then she says, I love you too, son. 
You're my child. That's our relationship with God, right? I forgive you. You are my son, my child, my daughter. I love you. Now, the problem was with with O'Shea, what did he say? I don't know that I can forgive myself. I think sometimes that's the hardest step in accepting the forgiveness that God offers through Christ is being able to forgive ourselves. And so today, in our time of confession and pardon, we're going to sing our our final song here together. And while we're singing, I want to invite you at the back of the room, um, you'll see there's tables with blue bowls. And in those bowls are, are some rocks. And I want you to pick up a stone just on your own when you feel the Spirit moving you. Whether it's something within yourself that you need to let go of, that you need to forgive yourself. Maybe it's somebody else that you need to forgive in order to find righteousness, to be made right again, your relationship with God or one another. Take a rock and bring it, bring it forward. Place it in the water, in this bowl. This picture being washed clean, being made whole. Amen.